security could be potentially 10 years ahead of where it is today. And as I dug into the data, you're really going to see that, th that that's the case. Now, I was surprised at the literalness of that term lost decade. Um, you know, when I, when I have a title like that, I'm a little hesitant in the sense that I don't want to come across as being too negative. I understand there's been some progress made by lots of stakeholders in this space. And I don't want to dis be dismissive of that. However, I think it's important that we focus or we understand the magnitude of the problem so we can motivate ourselves to, to put the push and the effort that's going to be required to make things better in the coming decade. And then I changed the subtitle of uh, the talk a little bit, an empirical analysis of public vulnerabilities. And it's empirical because this is all based on, on our observations, my observations primarily, and represents a significant chunk of work that I've done over the past five years. So could I be missing some things? Yes, but at the same time, I'm very confident in asserting that this is the most comprehensive um, analysis ever done of open source uh, vulnerabilities affecting the ICS space. OK, my purpose is to encourage vendors, asset owners, third party vulnerability handlers, and researchers to think more completely about the way they have handled and will handle vulnerabilities that potentially affect the world's critical infrastructure. To start off, we're going to do some same paging. Um, for a less uh, you know, technical or developed audience, I'd probably spend more time on this. We're going to breeze primarily through the same paging. Then I'm going to give some statistics and stories and intersped with those. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about some suggested resolutions in terms of New Year's resolutions, but new decade uh, resolutions. OK, so I wanted to come up with an analogy that kind of summarized what I'm going to talk about. And this photo really, really did it for me. If you're familiar with the story of David and Goliath, David, the youngest of his uh, siblings, is sent to check on them who are at war with the Philistines. And Goliath, this giant of a man, stands forth and challenges any of the Israelite armies or any of the troops to come and fight him one-on-one. -on -one. No one dares, but David, who has slain a bear and a lion, says, you know, I, I will take him on. Um, I love the look on the people's faces. Now, this guy's got his tongue sticking out. You probably can't see it. But Goliath saying, why are you sending a half-naked shepherd to fight me, a man of war? Well, we know that uh, Goliath is hit between the eyes. And I think that there's, there's a lesson here in the sense of we've got to be very careful. Dill talked earlier about the um, house of money in terms of boasting the resiliency of our critical infrastructure today. All right, so what is a vulnerability? This is a definition from Information Assurance Glossary. A weakness in information system, um, secure system security procedures, internal controls, or implementation that could be exploited. So that would include all of these things, OK? In terms of today's presentation, I'm going to talk about a condition in software that allows a threat actor to invoke unintended behavior. So I'm focusing only on software and threat actors which means that of this list, I'm focusing only on the bottom two. And those are just examples. Okay? I understand that there are other controls that mitigate many of these things, such as training, proper configuration, et cetera. But for the scope of this talk, I'm only focusing on software vulnerabilities. Okay? Um, as many of you may be aware, there are types of vulnerabilities that are documented in efforts like the CWE, the OWASP Top 10, SANS Top 25. And then there are efforts to document instances of vulnerabilities. That would include the CVE, Open Source Vulnerability Database, National Vulnerability Database, for example. Just as, um, I guess, some data to get us started, as of the beginning of this year, the Common Weaknesses Enumeration had 693 types of weakness. National Vulnerability Database lists 49,000 entries, and the Open Source Vulnerability Database, roughly 77,000. The Open Source Vulnerability Database does a nice job breaking those down by type. Um, I'm not going to dive into that, but it is interesting analysis that's done in near real time as that database is updated. To give a little bit of uh, background, sorry here, I wanted to talk for a minute about the vulnerability life cycle, okay? where vulnerability begins and, and hopefully how it ends. There are going to be design errors, coding errors. And then hopefully a patch. And this line in the middle represents roughly you know, what happens internal to a control system vendor and then what happens external generally 
You have discovery, release and disclosure, and perhaps weaponization. Notice the sling. Okay. Another way to look at that life cycle is kind of as a uh, subset, uh, uh, sets and subsets. And Richard Strauss made a similar diagram that he presented at the ICSJWG last fall. But I think it's important to realize that there are errors, which may or may not be vulnerabilities. And then you've got vulnerabilities. And you've got vulnerabilities, only a subset of which are discovered. Only a subset of those are disclosed. And only a subset of those are patched. So when we're talking about vulnerabilities that are disclosed, we're talking only about a very small portion of all the vulnerabilities that exist. Okay? It's also important for us to consider the relationships that exist between these different sets through the, uh, through the vulnerability life cycle. And as you start to consider the relationships, the idea of a competency model begins to pop out. For example, a vendor that is competent in dealing with security, they are going to try to minimize the number of errors that exist in a piece of software. They're going to try to minimize the number of vulnerabilities that they're creating. And then ultimately, they're going to try to make that, that number that's patched the same or as close as they can to the total number of vulnerabilities that exist in their product. The same can be said in terms of dealing with um, these different, the different categories by an asset owner or even by researchers. Okay. Uh, so when I'm talking about industrial control systems vulnerabilities, which is really what we're here to focus on, I'd like to divide these into three simple categories. The first is platform and environment software. So that would be you know, your operating system, your database software. Then your industrial control system software, which would include what we generally think of as uh, SCADA and engineering workstations, that type of thing. And then the, one of the portions that we often overlook is bundled third party and OEM software, which would include ActiveX controls, web servers, embedded operating systems. Um, I want to point out here that you know, in terms of platform and environment software, one of the things we try to do at Critical Intelligence is look at the numbers of vulnerabilities that are released that affect software commonly deployed in control systems environments, but are not considered, at least we don't consider them to be control system specific soft, um, products. So during quarter three, for example, we figured that about 22% of the vulnerabilities added to the National Vulnerability Database are also applied to control environments. And then I also want to point out the control system vendors, they're software companies, okay? Um, this is an example over quarter three, how many patches or updates, and this doesn't necessarily mean they're security related, but updates did these different vendors um, ship over the quarter. <clears throat> All right. So what is it that we expect of the different parties in this vulnerability, you know, dealing with vulnerabilities? The vendors, well, we expect you to sell and support products that run critical infrastructure. I mean, you look at your marketing or your websites, and that's what you're saying you do, OK? As part of that, we expect you to be able to discover and fix errors and vulnerabilities in your software. Now, there are some interesting, some interesting work being done in terms of measuring or assuring that vendors are doing that well. And I'm not going to go into that too much, but the concept of capability and maturity definitely pops up. What do we want for the ICS asset owners? Well, they need to run the infrastructure continuously. And that includes having their own security capabilities and, of course, working with the vendors. OK, researchers, what goes into the process of discovering a vulnerability that's in a product? Well, tools, research awareness and interest, their talent and experience, the quantity of researchers looking, and the motivation of those researchers. And you're going to see, as I get to the statistics, um, the effect that increases in these inputs has had. When a researcher finds a vulnerability, they have a variety of options. Okay? They can disclose in, in any ways. The detail in those disclosures may also differ. What do we expect of third parties? Well, who are dealing with vulnerabilities or providing vulnerability information. We expect you to understand the change in risk, technical implications, and possible consequences of those vulnerabilities. And then we want you to communicate clearly and quickly with a variety of stakeholders. OK, as we get to the numbers, now the statistics portion, I want to point out that I am counting just these two. Okay? I'm not counting the platform and environment software vulnerabilities. And I also make an exception in the third one in that embedded operating systems, I am not counting the vulnerabilities in Windows Embedded, Windows Compact, Windows CE. 
even though those definitely apply to embedded uh, to industrial PCs. Okay, uh, there are probably hundreds of vulnerabilities that I'm not counting that go into uh, those embedded OSs. All right. So by quarter, what do we see? Well, the first vulnerabilities we saw quarter one, uh, 20, um, excuse me, 2001, and you'll notice that that's roughly you know, 11 years of data, and definitely we seem to hit an inflection point right about uh, the end of 2010. So if we look at the data by the numbers, you'll see that in 2010, we more than doubled those discovered in 2009. And in these years of 2011, we more than doubled all that existed in the previous decade. All right, so I think that's because I, one of the reasons I believe that is is obviously Stuxnet garnered lots of attention. Lots of researchers started looking at the problem using the tools that already existed. Now, the vulnerabilities we're talking about, I again want to emphasize that they're really only a drop in the bucket of the total vulnerabilities that you can read about or, or something about in the press. For example, Achilles, uh, World Tech with their Achilles fault injection tool, in January 2009, they said they had more than 1,000 unique vulnerabilities in their database. Billy Rios and Terry McCorkle, who had the class here uh, yesterday using their techniques, discovered at least 665 unique vulnerabilities. So the point is that these 364 I'm talking about are barely scratching the surface. No, I haven't. This is all open source. Um, I'll talk about validation hopefully in, in a few moments. But um, <coughs> validation is a very interesting and uh, important thing, but good question, good point. OK, so what vendors are involved in these? Well, um, like I said, we're going to talk about Beck in a minute. The, the vendors that are highlighted in orange are the vendors I'm going to tell some stories about. And I just wanted to give you an idea of when some of these vulnerabilities were discovered. OK, so look, look at the scoreboard. Um, Iconix is in the lead. Siemens in close second. Um, you can see about half of the headquarter countries are from the United States, but we've got them from all over the world. Um, it's a total of 75 vendors. Um, so I took those vulnerabilities and I said, OK, how many patches have I observed them put out um, on those vulnerabilities? Again, Iconics in the lead, uh, Siemens and others uh, trailing. I want to point out that Seven Technologies has done a, a, pretty, a pretty good job there. And as you might expect, um, also, I mean, Invensys has done OK. And y you might wonder here about Cisco. Um, they own a building automation company, and those are the majority of those vulnerabilities in that software. Okay, so I think it's important to realize as well that we're talking about patches, uh, kind of to Zach's point, that not all patches themselves, well, not all vulnerabilities are created equal. All patches are not created equal either. So here is a tweet from someone who attended S first. They said the ICS cert has seen 60% failure in fixing in patches, fixing the reported vulnerability. That means that if a researcher comes to them with a vulnerability and they coordinate with the vendor and the vendor gives them a patch and say, hey, does this fix it? Then ICS cert um, says no, 60% of the time, that patch does not fix the vulnerability. All right, that's what I understand that means. And that doesn't give me a lot of confidence in their capabilities. Ruben Santa Marta, just reversed the most silly patch I've ever seen. It does not fix the vuln, but the public exploit. And here's a statement from Dylan Beresford. When working with Siemens, he said that um, they had an idea to fix the problem, and he said that he bypassed it relatively quickly. Okay. When a vendor gets a patch, they have or receives a vulnerability report. They have several options in dealing with the patch or, deal, or producing a patch for that. And one would be produce a patch for that specific instance of a vulnerability. Okay. Another would be look at our system and try to understand root cause, why did that exist, and try to fix that. And third, it would be, let's look at all our code base and determine how many times we made that same error and then try to fix them all. Okay? So again, this idea of um, capability and maturity. All right, now that said, I looked at some of the disclaimers that were sent with certain software patches. And here's one from Invensys that doesn't make me feel fuzzy, warm and fuzzy. 
Invensys does not warrant that the software will meet customers' requirements, that the software will operate in combinations other than are specified in Invensys documentation, or that the operation of the software will be uninterrupted or error-free, and we're limiting our liability to $500. Okay. <laughs> um, here's another one from a patch that uh, Siemens put out this in the uh, factory link. This module is being made available as is with no warranty of any kind. Now, I understand vendors' desire to limit liability, but you are marketing products that are running critical infrastructure. Okay. So I want to t break down the data by exploits. And by exploits, I'm including everything from proof of concept to exploit module that works in exploit framework. Okay, so um, against, these are against the vendors. So then by primary sector serve, what I did is I went through and looked at the vendor documentation to see wh those products they talk about, what sectors do they serve. The majority serve multiple sectors. Okay? They're targeted at many, but a lot of them also are sector specific. And so there are the breakdown on those. We have not seen, um, there's lots of vendors that we haven't seen, for example, gas and oil. We haven't seen a lot of Honeywell. We haven't seen much of Emerson Process or Yokogawa. Um, industrial networking, we haven't seen Ruggedcom or Garrettcom. Electric sector, we haven't seen Schweitzer, Telvent, Surveillant, um, Epikek, OSI International, or GE Digital Energy. And in nuclear, we haven't seen anything at all. OK, so how about the exploit frameworks? Um, once again, these are not orthogonal. There can be a Metasploit and a Core Impact and an Immunity Canvas exploit for any given vulnerability. But obviously, Immunity Canvas is kind of leading the way due to the research efforts of, or, or the exploit efforts of GLEG. Then I want to break those down by vulnerability type. Um, I don't think this is particularly useful, but it's you know, semi-interesting anyway. It drives home the point that vulnerabilities that exist in any other kind of information system also exist in industrial control system. All right, by researcher. Okay, Luigi, by far, um, leading the pack in terms of publicly disclosed vulnerabilities. Again, about half of these kind of leading researchers come from the US, but we have good representation from the rest of the world as well. So I wanted to compare for a moment the sources, where this information coming from. You know, open source intelligence, which is critical intelligence, is gathering this information. We count 364. Open source vulnerability database, if you enter SCADA, returns 236. The national vulnerability database, 154. ICS CERT 168. And CERT CC 56. So I just want to put those on a graph to give you an idea visually of what the difference is. OK, so um, here, you know, what technically is what the difference between those. Well, I'll start with the open source vulnerability database. The idea, in essence, was launched in 2000, went live in 2000, or excuse me, 2002, went live in 2004. Lots of information. Um, they cover the deeper information than you can find, for example, at the, open, or the National Vulnerability Database. If you're looking for a vulnerability, you know, quasi-vulnerability management system that's free, um, they do a very nice job. And by, by, by management, I don't mean remediation. I mean information coming into you that you can, that you can uh, match to your system. The CERT CC, they handled ICS vulnerabilities before the INL slash ICS CERT came online to handle those. It's my understanding there's now an agreement where if someone reports a control system vulnerability to the US CERT, that gets shipped to INL instead of to the Carnegie Mellon folks. Okay. And then when things go into the National Vulnerability Database, um, MITRE assigns a CVE number, and then an NVD anal analyst takes that vulnerability, does some work on it, assigns a CVSS score, and enters it into the database. So that's kind of the difference in how those work, or have worked in the past. OK, this is kind of the fun portion of the presentation, um, where we get to tell some stories. And um, so I've got five, five stories, and some of them have multiple chapters. But the first vulnerability was from a company, uh, Control System Vulnerability, Beck IPC, German-based company. And they sell this single chip in a computer. It's got uh, the uh, operating system, web server, et cetera, on there. 
It's apparently used by Westermo, which again, you may know, is an OEM to lots of other vendors. And at least 50 companies, according to their website, are integrating this product into products for their customers. Okay? So we're talking pretty deep in the supply chain here. So in May uh, 24th, 2001, Siberian says, hey, we did some analysis on this chip. Okay? And we found roughly 11 issues. And those issues include default factory passwords, um, user and password disclosure, denial of service. Seven of those 11 issues make their way into the National Vulnerability Database. And those same seven are also included in my count, okay, my 364. One week later, the vendor responds to Siberian and says, hey, we fixed two of those 11. Um, we can't reproduce two of them. And the remaining seven, the, our customer has to deal with those. Okay. Um, you'll see that this response in 2001 control systems has been, in essence, the mantra or the pattern for many control systems vulnerabilities, um, how vendors deal with them since then. So first, you've got to respond quickly and act like you're on top of it. Well, the only, the only problem with that, oh, let me go back one second here. No, no, we'll get here. The only problem with that is that how much investigation can you really dive into in a week when you're responding to this, to this researcher and saying, hey, we're done with this. Well, you're not looking deep into your, your code in that case. Obviously, put the onus on the customer. It's their problem in the end. You've got to ignore significance. Pretend like there was no problem with your, the way you developed the product in the first place. And then forget the supply chain, okay? They did nothing to tell their customers that there's a problem in their product. As a matter of fact, the same researcher who posted that to bug track, he posted also to bug track the information that Beck gave to him. So Beck, at least to my understanding, did not, did never tell their customers about the problems that had been reported to them. All right. Okay, ActiveX. Now, you remember that 27 of the 364 were in ActiveX controls. <coughs> if you're running a SCADA um, HMI that's based on Windows, there's a good probability that you've got some ActiveX controls in there. The first ActiveX vulnerability that I can find is in April 1997. Okay, Norton Utilities. Open source vulnerability database today has 969, and NVD has 815 entries for ActiveX. There are a variety of fuzzers out there that you can use to find vulnerabilities in these controls, which would be a good idea if you're a control systems vendor. Now, um, one of the first vulnerabilities disclosed ActiveX dealt was from Iconix. And Iconix is based in the United States, founded in 1986. By 1997, they had shipped 10,000 systems. So the same year, right, of that vulnerability, they'd already shipped 10,000 systems. Their systems are used in a variety of infrastructure sectors. As of 2010, 250,000 systems shipped all over the world. Okay, so you know, pretty popular, uh, relatively software might not be used in big critical infrastructure applications, but definitely used in a variety of things. So here's the vulnerability note. OK, so in December of 2006, in December of 2006 is when the, the vulnerability was found. In September of 2008 is the first exploit publicly uh, made available for a control system. Well, it's one of two that were made available about the same time. Uh, it was posted to Millworm. In October, there was a web-hosted exploit reported of this vulnerability, right? So if you've got an ActiveX control, it's going to require you to interact with a web server, and you know, maybe you could upload code or write a file on the browser that's hitting that website. Okay, So October of 2008 is technically, at least in my mind, the first time we saw evidence of an attack against any control system, uh, in the public anyway. In October 2008, U.S. SIR also issues this critical infrastructure information notice. And that notice is a subject of criticism because one is two years late. And number two, um, well, Joe Weiss says this. January 2000 buffer overflow, which is this one, was on the website demo, not in the release software itself. So Will, um, Will Dorman, who ran Ranzer and found the vulnerability, he found it in free software that he got off the internet. Well. Iconics came out and said that's just the vulnerability found is just in demo software. It doesn't affect the real product. Well, if you go to the website and you download the patches for the real product, you will see that the same time they posted the, they posted the new um, demo versions, they also posted this the exact same file to all their systems. Okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, what what are the lessons here for ActiveX? Number one, watch the environment. Okay, 1997 was the first ActiveX vuln. Number two, use the tools. There's lots of them out there. Number three, don't mislead. 
Number four, don't promote misleading information if you don't know yourself. And then number five, uh, this is you know it's kind of tongue in cheek, but do you remember which vendors are winning? Okay. Um, okay, number three, third party Juarez. And that's tongue in cheek if you know that Juarez or Wares or you know cracked software um, that you can get for, for free many times. Okay, data dynamics and Siemens. Uh, this vulnerability was disclosed in May of last year. When CC Flexible and RF Manager come with Active Reports 2.0. Software component developed by Data Dynamics. All right, Data Dynamics is a sub brand for Grape City Power Tools, which is a um, software component maker headquartered in Japan. Okay, so this Japanese made software is in these German products, but no one knew about it until May. Okay, if you went to the National Vulnerability Database, oh, let me go back one second. This, the, the Active Reports 2.0 was released in 2004, okay? Since 2007, there are five known vulnerabilities in that exact piece of software that no one has ever talked about, okay? Siemens never told anyone those vulnerabilities were in our product, okay? If they even knew it. Okay, uh, go ahead, web server and Rockwell. So there's a cross-site scripting and directory traversal vulnerabilities that were made public in February 2009. Digital Bond um, you know, discovered these. And if you have the Rockwell um, Ethernet module, you can grab the banner, and you'll see that it is a go-ahead web server. And then if you go to the National Vulnerability Database and do a search for go-ahead, you will see that there were 18 previous vulnerabilities in this product. Okay? And at least two of those appear to be the exact same ones that Digital Bond found. Okay? 2001. Okay, that's where we get the lost decade from. All right, this one should blow your mind because it certainly blew my mind. Okay, the ICCP server from live data used to communicate among utilities, ISO RTOs, um, significant player in terms of market share. At least 12 other vendors um, use that product in their products. Buffer overflow reported in May 2006. Again, digital bonds work. So, Uis Mar, if you remember him from S4 years ago, um, he, down he downloaded, he obtained the patched version of, um, of the live data server and did his own security analysis on it. And among the things that he found was that the management interface to that is running PHP Nuke 6 from 2003 with 25 known vulnerabilities. Okay, he found some other things too. But PHP Nuke is the management interface to live data. I, I'm really not sure what else to say about that. What are the lessons? Ignorance is not bliss. Okay? You need to find out if you're an asset owner and, and if you're a vendor, what third party stuff is in your products. And I think that's, that seriously is probably an issue for lots of vendors. Um, developers go, they write the code, they move on. If you're, not, if you're not taking care of your code, you might not have any way to know what's in there. Okay? Um, if you're an asset owner and you, you can track that down, there are ways to do that. You might want to uh, pull patches and try them yourself. You don't want to share that information with others. And definitely if you're a vendor, you need to be pulling the patches for the software that you're using a third-party software. And finally, you've got to tell people about it. Okay. All right. It's only the platform. So Wind River, they create a real-time operating system called VxWorks. It's a um, right, real-time operating system used in lots of places, spaceships, um, lots of stuff. Okay. It happens to be used by Rockwell, Schneider, Control Microsystems, PLCs. And, and probably many, many others, okay? So check this out. The, the first reference I can find of this is September 2006, though I expect that it existed before then. But as they send out, as, as they make their product available to other vendors, right, who incorporate that into their products, they give them these instructions. You will want to reconfigure VxWorks with only the components you need for your operation. You'll most likely want to remove components required for host development support, such as the WindyBug target agent, K. Okay? So that happens to run on port 17185. And if you were watching data at SANS Internet uh, Storm Center, you would see a spike in scanning activity on that port you know, in, in, uh, in between June and December 2006. Then if you read this book, Hacking VoIP, Chapter 3, it says, hey, look. TCP UDP port VxWorks 17185 is open in a lot of these things. Let's hit them with Nmap. Okay. 
Well, four years later, H.D. Uh, Moore uh, does a presentation at Black Hat Fun with VX Works, and he talks about 1817185. He talks about weak passwords, and he says, this service allows access to read memory, write memory, and even power cycle device. Combined, that means the problems with the vulnerabilities is enough to steal data, backdoor the running firmware, otherwise take control over the device. Right, that's his assessment of the problem. Okay, July 2010, same month. Rockwell acknowledges the mistake and ships an update. Okay. That was in uh, December of last year, Ruben Santa Marta right, comes public with the Schneider Vulns, which includes open port 72185. Schneider, they issue an important security notification. No patch, but just notification. Okay. They, they only missed the boat by five, you know, at least five years. Okay. Um, so that's a lost half decade. So what are the lessons? You know, an inability to follow supply chain recommendations for, um, for operating system does not speak highly of your approach to security lifecycle. There are lots of deployed devices out there today that will likely never be fixed. And if we want to harken back to, to BEC, which is a very similar product in some ways to VxWorks, um, we could have learned that 10 years ago. OK, design vulnerabilities. You know, um, the examples, hard-coded credentials, no authentication, homespun algorithms, things that DHS no longer calls vulnerabilities. And um, they take more time and energy to fix. So the first reference to hard-coded passwords, again, in the open source vulnerability database, January 1989. First reference in the, na in the national vulnerability database, August 2000. And obviously, it's a top 25 issue in SANS today. So what are examples in control systems? Um, Invensys Foxboro IA series, um, announced on a mail list in February 2005 at least. Siemens, um, these came public with Stuxnet, May 2005 in a Russian forum. And Schneider Electric PLCs, 18, 18 hard-coded accounts. OK. Um, well, let's put this in here just to show you that there are two um, that were posted to the forum. This guy says, hey, we found these. And that's in May. 2005, and then this guy says, okay, here they are. So 2008. Oh, and I always wonder, right, why do these guys, you know, what, what led them to find those and say that? Okay, firmware update. <coughs> July of 2008, Rockwell posts this um, thing. The INL and Department of Homeland Security identified a security concern within the firmware upgrade process. Then on Liquid Matrix, they say, hey, we did some open source intelligence, and Water ISAC leaked this thing about what's called Boreas that says that you can update control systems firmware and cause bad things to happen. Digital Bond took that and ran with it, doing kind of a proof of concept to S4, uh, January 2009. And uh, you know, here's a quote from Dale talking about the types of effects that you could potentially cause by exploiting that vulnerability. And Rockwell says, hey, that's cool. Thanks, uh, Dale. Um, we, we posted something on it before. We're going to post something again. And I've, I've never seen, once again, this is empirical, but I've never seen any fix um, proposed or, or, or put forward for that. OK, chapter C, replay. You remember this? Um, Beresford is going to speak at Takedown Con. He doesn't. He gets frustrated with Siemens. He talks with Dale. And then he spills the beans, so to speak. Um, it just so happens that the next month, DHS says design flaws are not vulns. And that same day, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure when Marty said that, but it could have been, it's in one or two days, Seaman says, oh, yeah, you know what? We have a weak point now. <laughs> we got a, it's, not, it's, it's a potential, potential weak point. And it's instant American Simotion, okay, which are their uh, machine, machining uh, applications. All right. So, the lesson, right, it's past time to address the big problems. Um, I did a little research on vendor vulnerability management. The Organization for Internet Security and NIAC say, hey, if you're a vendor, please give us slash security page and then give us an abuse or security at email address. Fairly common practice from a lot of vendors. Um, you'll see that the real-time operating system vendors um, don't do it so much, but the majority of you know, companies who you think as software vendors do. Um, but things don't go so well when we start breaking it down to ICS vendors.
I want to throw some kudos because, you know, I don't like to be all negative. But on May 24th, um, there's a vulnerability disclosed in Rockwell's EDS hardware installation tool. And my guess is that it's actually the same vulnerability that Jeremy Brown disclosed in March of 2010. But anyways, in June, a month later, Honeywell issued a warning to customers saying, hey, that software is bundled with every experience system. Well, that's awesome. They, they, they did the third party thing, okay? And if you go out to their website now, they have this thing where they show all the third party software that's in their experience system. So, way to go. Um, then I also want to say, hey, good on IGSS. Um, or this is really seven technologies, what I should say, seven technologies. But they've patched 16, 17. If I saw the, the news correctly, they've, I think they've patched the last one last week. So that's very good for them. And what they did is they have a nice RSS feed of feeds uh, of commits to their code repository. So you can actually get the feed, and you can say, hey, look, this update resolves this security issue. And this is all, this is all public. So if you're using their product, you can get, you know what they're working on right away. I think that's cool. So, you know, my recommendations, if you're an asset owner, you've got to get information and act. You've got to engage in some form of real-time risk management. You've got to think wider in terms of um, you know, what software is out there and deeper in terms of back up the supply chain. Okay? You've got to be very good at other defenses because, quite frankly, the vendors don't seem to be giving you a lot of support at this point. The vendors, you've got to commit, you've got to hire, you've got to learn. You've got to manage the life cycle, including the supply chain. And if you haven't been hit yet, you probably will. So stop asking for it. That's it. Questions, comments, suggestions? Well, I'll, I'll kick things off because I, I actually had a, quite a list there. Um, I, I think one thing, though, that maybe you didn't hit that I'd like you to touch on is we're getting this vast, and, and I actually, um, where did Kevin go? I, I, I brought this up at uh, an ICS JWG meeting. We're getting this huge increase in vulnerabilities. Um, as you said, doubling a couple years ago and now even doubling the total amount. But their impact on what would be considered critical infrastructure varies a great deal. You know, a lot of these are freely downloadable HMIs, and I think you even said. A lot of, for example, the refinery DCSs aren't on that list just because it's very expensive for a researcher to get their hands on those, not because they're so secure. That's exactly right. Have you looked or have you seen anyone or do you have any ideas about how you would somehow tie the potential impact to the critical infrastructure to the vulnerabilities? Because if you look at someone like DHS or INL or that, they probably shouldn't be spending their time on some freeware HMI that's used in some non-critical control system. They probably should be focusing on the things that actually run the critical infrastructure. Have you looked at all at the distribution of those sorts of things? or have any So it's a, it's a very good uh, question, a very good point, and I can tell you, I know from talking to DHS people, that they're very aware of, of that issue, uh, Dale. It's a good point. Um, and there are some you know, brief you know, heuristics that we could use to look at that. One would be, for example, hey, if we've got some market share information about what are the control systems that are most frequently used in um, you know, refineries, X, Y, Z. Well, if, if DHS can match that up you know, immediately, their knowledge of the environment, I'm talking about the, the big environment, where are these used, with the vulnerabilities that comes in, that allows them to prioritize. Um, it also help them perhaps prioritize response as well when they're doing incident responses. Yeah, because I mean, you just look at the work that Terry and Billy did. They you know, they dump 600 some bugs from 60 some vendors. Um, you know, is that really what we should be looking at? You know, and probably the answer is some of it. Yeah. But probably not others. Kevin Hemsley with ICS CERT. Um, there's so many things. <laughs> um, one on, on the issue of third party software. Uh, you brought up an excellent point on. Uh, th third party components used in control system software because most I think most end users most asset owners don't realize the, the third party components that are in that software some vendors do a great job at trying to monitor their third party components and make sure that they're updating and including in their uh, in their upgrade process those third party components others once that third party component goes in the software they forget about it and uh, and, and that is an issue um, so we, ha we we are aware of third-party components, and we have actually put out at times 
uh, multiple advisories. So we have one on the third party component, one in, in the software that's affected that we know of. But we don't always know which products are affected. But, uh, you know, there is an issue, an ongoing issue. I don't know what the answer is, is how, how do asset owners identify what third party components are in a control system software? But you bring up a good point. Uh, the, the other uh, comment I have is uh, just on the uh, Marty Edwards comment at ACS on, on uh, 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 design issues not being a vulnerability. Uh, I talked to Marty last week to make sure I was, I was not at I ACS, but I just wanted to clarify it's not, they're not, it's not that they are not vulnerabilities, but that ICS search should handle them differently. And sure, sure, and I, I, I do appreciate that. And, you know, when I say that, I am a little bit tongue-in-cheek, so that's, that's, that's valid for you to say that. I say that because it's, it's, been, it's been blogged and commented a lot. I just want to make that clarification. Okay. Andrew, I think you had a... Yeah, Andrew Ginter, Waterfall Security. Um, I was speaking to a, uh, a vendor a little while ago. They have a program with one of their products... Uh, it's, a, it's a major product in one vertical. So one out of the hundreds of products used in, in, in uh, you know, the space that, that is industrial control. They had done a survey and seen somewhere between 50 and 100,000 uses of vulnerable C functions like stir copy in the product. And were systematically going through and getting rid of all of those functions. So good for them. They had not done the work to figure out what fraction of those functions represented vulnerabilities. It's reasonable to expect in my mind that at least some fraction, at least one or two percent of those uses represent vulnerabilities. And so here in one product, it seems to me reasonable that we have more vulnerabilities than in the entire database you've published. What do the numbers that you've published here mean? So, like I say, I think that the numbers that, that I'm talking about this is a very good question. The, the, point, the point that I've tried to make is that it's really a drop in the bucket for what's out there. And the vendors really need to start taking a more comprehensive approach to the way that they're dealing with vulnerabilities. And that's, that's kind of my point. But I think asking what does it mean is the right question to ask. If you could uh, pass one back and introduce yourself. Uh, Paul Roberts from uh, Threat Post. Um, I guess uh, I would ask you what you think the impact of the ICS uh, statement wondering whether uh, vulnerabilities should be cons should be called vulnerabilities uh, because you know this is the way the systems were designed. These are design issues, not vulnerabilities. On addressing some of the issues that, that you're raising, and also uh, this is actually the 10th anniversary this week of the trustworthy computing memo from uh, Bill Gates at Microsoft, is that w which focused a lot on secure development rather than on on retroactive patching. Um, with that type of an approach, do you think yield benefits within the ICS community? So, to your first question, I think that you know if it's a design issue, obviously to me that that's a high it's, it's a higher you know, there's a, there's a greater consequence or definitely more effort required to do that. And in many times, um, it's a higher priority issue because it's built into the design and it's simply, you know, insecure. And with a second, obviously, you, I mean, to, to Andrew's point as well, that the vendors have got to take this comprehensive approach and focus, if we went back to the, the slide, you know, focus on minimizing the, the overall number of bugs in your software to start with, right? Um, that's, that's the best approach. And Billy, maybe you or Terry can can uh, comment on the, of your findings, how much of them were ActiveX related, if, if you could add that to your question or comment too. Yeah, a, a large number were ActiveX related. There are actually some third-party ActiveX controls as well, I think, in there. Um, but <clears throat> uh, this goes to the, the security at mailing deal. Yeah. Um, to tell you the truth, when Terry and I started our little effort, we were actually very nervous to approach ICS vendors, yeah. um, mainly because we thought that most of them were kind of <clears throat> old school. And if we were to send them an email saying, hey, uh, we maintained or we managed to get a hold of your product, and we found some security vulnerabilities, and here you go, we didn't know how they were going to react. And so the safest place that we could see was to go to some place like DHS and say, hey, um, we're a little bit leery of contacting these people directly because we don't know what the response is going to be. So we're going to direct all this to you, and we're going to let you be the buffer between us and the industry. So uh, when, I see your, 
when I see your chart and a lot of people are missing security at email addresses, I really think the first thing that needs to happen is there needs to be some outreach to say it's okay to send us this kind of stuff um, and we're not going to you know, respond with a huge hammer and nail you, right? Because that's something we were legitimately afraid of. You know? uh, and then the second thing is uh, part of the project that we worked on was just to find the software. And so when you put up a list of you know, various industries and the software that they use and that's popular in various industries, like we, just, we see stuff that we've never even heard of before. You know? and, and I'm wondering, you know, places like Microsoft and places like Apple, they'll give researchers like advanced copies of things. Like for example, when Lion came out, Apple gave Charlie Miller and my other colleague, Nitesh Nanjani, advanced copies and said, here you go. They went through the NDA process and this sort of thing and said, hey, take a look, tell us what you think, you know, and at the end of 100 days or whatever, this thing's not going to work anymore. Or they give MSDN licenses to schools so students can take a look at stuff like this. And I'm wondering if you think that would help uh, in the industry, you know, to maybe get a grip on what the security issues are and, and how those things are working. Yeah, I think that's I think that's definitely uh, a good a good approach that may give right the vendors some insight earlier in their uh, earlier in the life cycle at least a little bit. Obviously, the thing that that concerns me a little bit is reluctance on the part of the vendors to invest the resources they need to for themselves for their own capability. And so I think that relying on someone else is, is again kind of pushing that away from themselves. But again, that that is that is a possible solution that has benefits. So. Okay, let's uh, do one more here. Thank you. Um, Andrew West, independent consultant and chairman of the DMB Tech Committee as well. A uh, comment on the last comment, really. Um, speaking as an ex-vendor and talking to people from different organizations, there's a different culture in different companies about how they approach this. Some companies are more than happy to get everything you can tell them because it helps them fix, improve their product and they're really proactive even though it might not look that way from the outside, they're really very concerned. Some companies say they're very concerned and they go through the motions, but they don't get it. And so they have a partial result. So it's still, keep pushing it. The word is not out there throughout industry, but some people are really very, very interested in working to improve things. Thank you. Can I just maybe hit you up for a prediction, a prediction. Uh, based on your statistical analysis and such? So. Do you have, would you hazard a guess as to the total number of vulnerabilities in 2012, ICS vulnerabilities in 2012, we'll see as compared to 2011? And then secondly, um, the number of companies or products with vulnerabilities that will be found in 2011 as opposed to 2012? Okay, so I, I'm not, I can at least get to the, to the first one maybe in my mind. My guess is that we're going to see, um, we're still going to see much higher numbers than we saw in uh, 2009, 2010, but I don't think we're going to see quite the same size. Um, I think that some of these researchers have kind of, have kind of proved, proved their point, and some of the low-hanging low fruit has been had. Now, I know, on the other hand, that the ICS cert has, still has a pretty good pipeline um, to come in. So my prediction is, is probably going to be a similar year, maybe not as, as many as we saw in uh, 2011 or 2012. Hmm. Actually, a decrease. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very prediction. much. Thanks a lot, Sean. That was great. <laughs>